I used to do lots of things. I used to do things and I'd say things and Jesus, I was evil. Say things and break things and Jesus, I was evil. I never shook babies. All right, welcome to episode 31 of the Reckless Muse cast. Uh, we have another guest. Uh, Kim Katiti, you are a Renaissance woman. You are a painter, a rapper, a skater, um, and I believe you were the one who brought down BNC News. If I'm not, <laughs> if I'm not uh, mistaken. <laughs> oh God! Hello. Um, thank you. I I appreciate uh, the Renaissance label. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I don't think I brought down BNC, but I was there on the last days, uh, which is kind of sad. But yeah. Yeah. Oh. But uh, um, so one of the things uh, I, I want to start talking to you. So, so you have an interesting background. You're from Uganda. Yes. And you moved to the U.S. What, it was about nine years ago, I think you said. That's right. Yeah. Um, so and, and then uh, uh, you, you, you first got started in music production. Correct. That's right. And, then, and That's so, right. so 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 tell us about like like, you know, kind of like like your your sort of career history, how you went from that to to where you are now. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Joe, Ben, also, thank you for having me on. I just met Joe the other day, <laughs> like literally a couple of days ago, and yeah. we had a great time chatting and I, yeah. I met Ben just a few minutes ago. So yeah. <laughs> um, I'm excited to to get into this conversation with y'all. But yeah, well, I'm thanks for coming from, on. I, I appreciate it. Um, I'm from Uganda. I am mm. ethnically Ugandan, like my family is, you know, from Uganda as well. Um, and I lived in Africa in different countries, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, uh, throughout my like teens and like childhood years. Then I moved to the United States when I was 19, um, specifically to study audio production. Uh, came with that intent in mind and, and graduated with a little bit more than I had bargained for. I had a very a pessimistic, cynical, what a lot of people will call like woke, hyper aware worldview. Mm -hmm. um, and lens through which to view the world. And I didn't realize um, how foreign that was to my experience as, you know, and something that didn't come naturally to me and how much it affected me negatively than it, than it was positive. So um, that's something I've started talking a lot about now, um, mm -hmm. kind of the ways that I got to um, inadvertently meet Joe and, and yeah, and here we are. So, so yeah, go ahead, Ben. So, um, Kimmy, I was uh, watching some of your channel and, uh, I have a lot of notes on your, on your videos and one of them, and I think you kind of just touched on this, like how, um, uh, I guess if you want to call it wokeness started to shape your worldview. And I think you use the term like a CRT lens, yeah. like, a um, do you, and then you did a video that I watched on, um, microaggressions like basically mm -hmm. a day of microaggressions and how this kind of just like shaped uh your everyday experience mm -hmm. for i mean you tell me how, how many years and how it sounds like exhausting that was with very yeah. little benefit if any and, and i don't mean to put words in your mouth but if, if you could just uh, speak to that yeah totally um so i started like college officially in 2014 um, a bit of a late, later than most Americans would start college, um, cause I was like 20, I think. Mm. Um, but I was also very tired of, I'd moved from country to country, uh, Uganda, Tanzania when I was like 10, 11, then South Africa when I was like 13 and, uh, South Africa had just, you know, we were still kind of healing from apartheid, which had only ended in 94. I moved there in 2006. So we're just shy a decade of of ending segregation in South Africa, right? right? So there's a lot of, there was a lot of tension there. And so when I came to the US, uh, I did not experience the same level of tension. However, the dialogue around race and identity was very, I, I don't know, it was, more, it was stronger. It would grip you to the core of your being. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out why that is. I think it's because you know, there's not a lot of focus on healing. There's more focus on policy change, which is a whole other conversation. But um, so, yeah, I had a critical what I would call a critical lens just to 
kind of broaden the scope because this would include um, uh, like not not gender ideology, but feminism, I would suppose, and then also um, the race part of things. And you have a lot of studies that that make up the body of critical race theory. Um, it's not just like one book, like, you know, oh, this book influenced colleges. It's, it's a field of work in academia that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw decided to um, not only label her work, but kind of create the label critical race theory uh, to be an umbrella term for all these studies on race in America. Right. Um, and some of them were for like legal purposes. Others were just like out of interest. Others were more concerned with like representation. And um, there's, it's so vast, it's so broad. So it's very hard to say like, it was just this one book and, and this book should be banned, right? So you have studies that say, um, for example, let's take the car sales thing. There's a study um, by this dude's name. I think his first name is Ian, but I, I'll butcher his last name where he says that white people will sell to other white people, uh, will sell cars to other white people at a lower rate. And they'll like unintentionally have a bias to sell cars to black women at a much higher you know, price. So you have these studies, like the one I just mentioned, scattered throughout college through different classes, symbolism. Um, you'll have a class on like philosophy or critical thinking. And you have these different studies scattered throughout there. And what you come out with is what I kind of tried to put together in that video of uh, 24 hours of microaggressions, where you're, you know, you're going to the store and you're seeing how the Starbucks barista interacts with you. And you're kind of creating your own critical race theory paper. You're like, this barista is putting less cream in my coffee, most likely because I'm black. There's a subconscious, you know, connection with like giving me less. Um, you, you try to walk out the door of that Starbucks and you notice someone doesn't hold the door for you. You're writing your own paper about how people subconsciously um, don't really care about holding doors or extending courtesy for Black people. And so that's how that really just kind of breaks down your worldview to be very self... Um, you're putting yourself down oftentimes without really noticing it um, after you spend so much time in this like critical... Uh, work and literature if that makes sense right Whew. yeah so so um and i like how you kind of started uh what you were saying with it's an umbrella term it's yeah. a, a body of work and i find it so disingenuous when uh defenders of let's just keep calling it critical race theory will say like oh well actually critical race theory isn't being taught in schools it's it's only in law school or it's only yeah. and that's not like that's not the point and the mm -hmm. point is, I, I like to say kind of, well, everything's being viewed through a racial lens, like every single interaction viewed mm -hmm. through a racial lens, every law, every um, every institution, every statistic viewed through a racial lens. And I, I think that's really what, uh, how it should be um, yeah. analyzed. And I think you, uh, I, I quoted you here, I like this term you use, it's the world conspiring against you. It's this, yeah. it, it, and I don't know if that's subconscious or just kind of beaten into you in college. So that's where most people are um, um, uh, exposed. Indoctrinated. To, yeah, exposed, indoctrinated to this. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that, 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 that kind of feels like a, a human rights abuse. Like, <laughs> why? Yeah. Like, like you're, you're making people just, who, human beings have, already enough shit going on like mm -hmm. like everyone has their issues and um i i tend to lean way more towards socioeconomic uh mm -hmm. and, and people at the regardless of race and then people with disabilities and just many addiction and many other issues and mm -hmm. you don't need to be beating into them that the world isn't conspiring against you because of the color of your skin yeah um, and i i i think you also use the term that it's a and, and if you could expand on this, is it's mm -hmm. a hypocritical uh, ideology? Yeah. Um, uh, should I? Break yeah, that down yeah, a little bit? Okay. yeah. Please. Mostly, the the thing I find incredibly hypocritical is the legs arm of <laughs> it's a weird way to put it. Legs arm the like the on the ground um, activism of critical race theory is critical social justice which to me, they're still kind of in the same room. Like they're not, 
it's not this far off study. A lot of people who defend critical race theory say like, no, you're talking about critical social justice, but it's still, it's from the critical theory, like framework. Right. Right. Um, and so critical social justice will often um, put up this, you know, put black folks who have a specific narrative on pedestals and say, listen to their lived experience. Mm. Um, and but there's a certain way in which that lived experience is acceptable. And it's mm. the lived experience that is of the victimized like worldview. Like I am a victim, I have suffered. I, I know that I experience racism every day. Um, I, I will only be helped unless like policy changes and we rework systemic racism. If you are a black individual, however, and you say, no, I don't really believe that's the way um, and I'm not diagnosing this issue the same way you're diagnosing it. I think it's more of a human, we're dealing with humanity and not just simply racism. Then that's looked down upon and even criticized. And then your lived experience becomes uh, your, um, your uh, like aligning with whiteness or you're basically regurgitating white supremacy in your voice. And so you're not only is it not your lived experience, but uh, you know, it's sad that you are actually taking on an experience of white supremacy. Well, so I, it's yeah. so, yeah, that's just one aspect yeah. of hypocrisy that really kind of gets on my nerves. Well, it, it's it's a catch-22. It's it's basically saying, if you're not with us, you're against us. Yeah. And, and you're not um, politically black. Yes. Exactly. Oh my God. Yeah. I wanted to bring up examples. Thank you, Joe, for saying that. I actually forgot that one, which is one of my favorites. Uh, um, yeah. But, but yeah. uh, and, and Kimmy, I, I watched another one of your videos where you talk about um, just kind of the racism that has permeated throughout quote unquote anti-racism mm -hmm. where it's almost like it's not always white people, but a lot of times it's white people getting a pass mm -hmm. to be overtly racist, like 1950s level racism to black people because the black people aren't falling in line with the ideology and some examples yeah. of this um uh, you brought up ones like Uncle Tom and Coon, like these terms mm -hmm. being thrown around. Uh, I remember there's one of women. This one was more of just like uh, white liberal brains being broken, where it was women in an elevator, white women in an elevator. They looked like in the, they were in their 50s or 60s. And there's a black man in there who he didn't want to wear a mask. And he didn't have to, I don't believe. It's not like he was breaking mm -hmm. any law. And they were freaking out at him for not wearing a mask. And he's mm -hmm. like, I, I'm just minding my own business. Like, stop, you know, saying things to me. And of course, the cell phones come out and everyone's recording. And they start like hitting him. And cool. while they're literally, hold on, <laughs> while they're old, because it's not even the best part. <laughs> while they're hitting, while two white women are hitting a black man, they're yelling, Black Lives Matter. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it doesn't make any sense wow. to me. Oh. And it just shows like they're so confused and it's a combination of going viral and um, trying to do the right thing oh. and, and just be your wires being crossed right. where it's uh, yeah. And li you're literally assault and uh, maybe they're trying to take the fun of him. I don't know exactly, but they're getting physical with him while shouting black lives matter. And then the last example I'll give, which to me showed this to me is one of the worst uh, examples of the worst as in most severe uh, examples of just racism and in, in uh, for anti-racism. This happened in your both home city of Los Angeles, where the L.A. Times came out and called Larry Elder, a black man, the black face of white supremacy, yeah. Yeah. Um, which doesn't make sense. And how is that allowed? And also against Larry Elder. Um, a white woman spit on him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and that stuff you used to see in like Arkansas in 1950 when they're trying to desegregate the schools or something like that. Mm -hmm. This happened in 2021 Los Angeles where a white woman and nothing happened. Nothing mm -hmm. happened because yeah, so. he's a conservative. Um, yeah. And Angie was a white liberal standing up for, for this ideology. So yeah. um, it's to me, it's shocking. I don't know if yeah. you have any insight on any of that, but it, yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I do, I get, I get that a hundred percent. Um, uh, the Larry Elder thing obviously was very shocking. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I think the reason they get away with this is because they have, I mean, by they, I'm talking about like kind of the, the radicalized, slightly cultish, like 
ultra leftists because there are yeah. there are a lot of leftists who are very critical of this thing itself yeah. which i don't still don't know what to call it um but they're just like completely i'm um, trying to find a, a you know a, a way to live or a purpose in life and so they turn to social justice to fill a certain hole um and i feel like that gorilla girl who i think she was in a gorilla suit or something yes oh um, i forgot that part yeah she was wearing like yeah. a gorilla mask or something. Jesus. Um, gorilla <laughs> mask that's right yes yeah um i really how, feel okay? like, <laughs> how did i don't know how all the news outlets just skipped over this but the thing about the american dialogue on race is there's such a like it, there's a political aspect of it that is so hard to remove because there's no interest in healing there's no interest in reconciliation mm. um it's just kind of like how can i make you care about race in a way that will drive you to vote in a particular direction right. um and i'm realizing that that's kind of why it, it's so strange to talk about forgiveness when it comes to racism or reconciliation or if you remember in the BLM protest days in 2020, like there were there were moments where people were like hugging the cops and like being very like, like, I'm yeah, sorry yeah. and I forgive you. And then like a lot of like these ultra crazy cultish people were like, don't do that. You yeah, cannot yeah. do that because that is against what we're trying to fight for, right. which is abolition. Right, and yeah. so I think that's why they get away with calling people like Larry Elder, uh, you're the voice of white supremacy because whiteness and blackness has nothing to do with like our skin color at this point it's more about mm -hmm. are you for my ideas if yeah. you are then i will give you the black label with so much grace but if you aren't you're a white supremacist and it's just the craziest mind-bending thing um that's happening right now so one thing i want to ask you bringing this into like the more creative realm you've been in la for a while and and i'm, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've met and interacted with a lot of creative people in in, in la um how prevalent do you think a lot of this you know woke ideology is is among artists and and you know is it, 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 do you think it's 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 pretty prevalent here or mm. do you think that you know, there are a lot of people who are who are just kind of subscribing to it in a very superficial way just to kind of fit in or i'm i'm, I'm curious about, about your thoughts on that yeah surprisingly in 2022 i would say um there are i have noticed that a lot of people here are they've reached the point where they've been so like in that space of like the dogmatic social justice thing yeah. they're kind of tired of it right now yeah, and they're, yeah. they're like you can talk to them in a way that's kind of like i'm i'm fed up with like being super woke and i'm kind of i'm yeah. tired of all that i just want to yeah. like take a breather and they get it yeah. but like if you go out to maybe like not so progressive places mm -hmm. i feel like they're only just starting to like realize there's this hyper aware way to look at the world and so they're harder to like convince that like no trust me if you go too far to the left of things yeah, like yeah. it's also not good so i'm like right. there's like oh they're just starting their journey and then people here in like la are like kind of coming over the hill and they're like, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm kind of tired of this. That's what I'm noticing. What are you Yeah. Doing? I've been lucky enough to, uh, you know, I, I've only been in LA for, for almost two years now. And, and, you know, it's, it's only been kind of recent that, that things have started to open up and, and, you know, that, that, that I've started to kind of meet more people here. I've been lucky though, to, to meet other creative people like yourself and, and, and Alma who, who, who um, are, are not woke, for example, as well as other people who are sort of like, it's funny I, i've met a few other people who who, who still identify as progressive but they're sort of like yeah but you know they're, they're like this obsession with diversity and inclusion it's starting to go get a little too far like yeah you know okay so you start hiring more women and people of color okay that's fine that's all i care about like we don't need to keep pushing it even further so like i i i think you're right um and and you know like i said i i think my social circles are, are probably a little smaller than, um than, than yours but but that's kind of what i'm feeling now is mm. sort of like yeah yeah this is getting a little too crazy maybe we should pump the brakes a little bit um yeah. so i'm hoping that that trend continues right um but it does seem like like the the, the bigger entertainment industry aspect is is, is going even crazier with oh, a lot yeah. of this work stuff unfortunately yeah it's it's on the corporate level though i feel like exactly there's a different dialogue happening where yeah. they're so like head in and i don't know why do you guys have any ideas why 
I don't know. I think it's because, so I think that, well, one, Kimmy, as you were saying, that a lot of this, I think even two years ago during what, you know, I, has been called the Great Awakening, and I want to mm. uh, relate this to religion too and, and talk about forgiveness and, and how this is a religion and a cult, as you said. But mm. I do think this actually took off much stronger in wealthier urban neighborhoods and the suburbs. Uh, right. This, I mean, I, I anecdotally, when I was, and, and same goes with like the mandates, uh, and I don't want to get into COVID stuff really, but for instance, I, I go to New York a couple times a month for the past you know, year, year or so. And um, the, the, the vast majority of the Black Lives Matter and the rainbow flags and all of that are in overwhelmingly wealthy and white neighborhoods mm. uh when i go to harlem no one asks to see my covid passport mm -hmm. you don't see really any of that stuff uh in philly when i'm around penn where i would be um you see tons of it it's very white and asian you see a lot right. of every, almost every stoop would have black lives matter or, or the, the whatever the intersectional flag now is it's not even lgbt flag it's like the inter intersectional flag and yeah. more western parts of philly that are overwhelmingly black um you don't see that and overwhelmingly mm -hmm. not just black but uh, i think they have a big ethiopian population yeah. um, you don't see you don't see that stuff right? yeah. not nearly as much mm -hmm. um i and and just voting wise if you want to cut it down to red blue uh i think philly's a great example philadelphia swung hard to the right uh, mm -hmm. in the 2020 election every mm -hmm. county around it swung hard to the left Mm. so right. so and and you can check and that's most that's a lot of cities that's mm. new york that's la actually la swung hard to the right but mm. around and la is kind of a big sprawling city anyway but um yeah so so i i do and uh i know you're very critical uh, rightfully so of like people like robin d'angelo and this kind mm. of corporate corporatization of uh crt or, or wokeness or whatever it is that you know you would have tables of white women paying someone to come berate them about this for two hours yeah. and pay and pay them uh, hundreds if not thousands of dollars mm -hmm. so uh to get to your, your question why uh, not that i know of it but sorry not oh. that i know but uh I, I think that it's uh a handful relatively of loud voices over not over educated but very educated white and non-white gen z and young millennials in these corporations who uh, are making their way into the middle management mm -hmm. mostly at the bottom but making their way into, and they have very 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 loud voices and yeah. honestly the upper man is, is terrified they're yeah. just scared because not that because of public shaming like yeah i, I think that's what it is. i think it's just about public shaming i, I which is it. it's just I mean, insane yeah. because it's they don't have like the 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 employees and 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 the 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 customer base that that is clamoring for this for for these you know more woke changes, they don't have mass behind them. They only have volume. It's just screeching. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's not. It's like that. You you represent like two percent. Uh, uh, you would uh, think the market would fix this, right? Yeah. But, yeah. And maybe it is. Like I, I don't know it necessarily. Uh, sometimes the product is that good. Like yeah. Pixar movies are great. Like it's, if they yeah. if they keep going yeah. in a direction, but I don't think people are really gonna same with Disney. Like Disney's just so massive, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's such a part of all our culture. But I think people can be pushed too much, and there needs needs to be a competitor. Um, yeah, that, right. that comes out and says, no, we're just gonna make children's movies. Um, yeah, right. But or, I think I, I I think you know my point is is that like you know it's it's the. The, the upper management is mistaking all of the loud voices. They think that it, that, that it's a large crowd, but it's actually yeah. not. It's just they, they think just happen that they're to have representative. The yeah, they exactly. Think that the loud voices yeah. are representative of the right, generation, right. which is the next batch of customers. But right. but it's not right. Um, and and the same goes actually for universities. Universities are different because it's not a market, yeah. but it's just the deans and presidents are just terrified. Yeah, they're just terrified yeah. of the students where they didn't used to be. Which um, it always cracks me up. Like whenever like a celebrity apologizes for something very trivial like they said a, you know, they made a racist joke 12 years ago or whatever and like yeah. and, and, and and but and it's like like i i can see why in the moment on twitter it would seem like oh man like everybody's telling me i need to shut up but it's like dude mm -hmm. you've got 12 million uh followers and only five thousand people are yelling at you like come on yeah. like right <laughs> 
Um, and, and, you know, five thousand people all at once can seem like a lot, but it's like, yeah, but the other, sure. you know, like ninety five percent of your audience doesn't give a shit. Yeah, Kimmy. So, um, as you noted, you've you're you're from Uganda and you've lived in several different parts of Africa, mm-hmm. and uh, I want to ask a question about your you know your experience with racial politics in the U.S. But I want to preface that. Mm. By saying, are you familiar with the writer? Um, I always butcher her name. Uh, uh, Chimamanda Ngichi, uh, Ngozi Adichie, yeah. the Nigerian yeah. writer. Have yeah. you read Americana by any chance? I read the, just the beginning of it. haven't finished okay. it yet. Yeah. I, I think it's a beautiful, wonderful book. Um, mm-hmm. Huge fan of it. Mm-hmm. And she's actually come out pretty much against uh, against a lot of this identity politics stuff, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, I, haven't heard, I haven't heard in a while, but... Um, I remember a passage in it where she talks about being in some, I think in New York, somewhere mm-hmm. in the United States. And uh, there was a, uh, she was working in a store and the store, you know, the the salespeople would get a commission if they sold a piece of clothing. Right. Mm-hmm. And a customer was like, she asked the customer, well, who, who helped you? Like, which were, so I can, give them the credit Mm -hmm. and the customer and there's like a white worker and a black worker Mm -hmm. and the customer just like couldn't get herself to say it was the black worker right the the black salesperson Mm -hmm. you know she would say the clothing style or what you know what you know what she was wearing or something Mm -hmm. like that and she found this so strange it's like well just that you know it we're just using for identification yeah the the, the, the black and actually identification to give her more money because exactly. she helped you and 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 the person that did kind of do some mental gymnastics the customer yeah. i might be butchering this a little but i read this like four years ago but mm-hmm. I, I it's to that effect it's just like why wouldn't you just say the black salesperson um mm. and, and the same goes with one other thing where it's like our concept of white black latino all this stuff changes where you brought up earlier i wanted to jump in and say um vote a certain way like mm-hmm. people will use and that's why actually one of our segments on the show is called White Hispanic Watch. And mm-hmm. it's ever since La- Latinos recently have started voting more right wing, like in the mm-hmm. past couple of years. And now you start seeing the media using terms like white Hispanic that were never used before. Even right. though there are big differences in, you know, people from Argentina and Mexico and even within those countries, huge differences. Yep. But mm-hmm. It was all just Latinos when it was politically advantageous to say the Latino mm-hmm. bloc votes more this way. But now that there's more fracturing, mm-hmm. it's, well, they're white Hispanic. And exactly. then there's like the good. And I just thought um, that's another that's example that, that well, I always yeah. point out to Joe. Uh, I say, Joe, here, there's another white Hispanic watch. Oh, um, Uh-oh. But well, anyway, um, there's an article that said like white Hispanic nationalism or something like that. Or, wow. Yeah. Just, like, it was, the, well, the oh, best was no. in 2020. There was a there's a police shooting and it was the first time I saw it. It was like white Hispanic cop shoots, you know, X, Y, Z. Yeah. And yeah. it was like, I'd never seen that before. And there's a reason that you're using this term now. Mm. And it just looks like a Latino police officer, which in California, which I think is where it took place, is like 40 percent of police officers or something mm. are Latino. Right. So anyway, but That's but with the crazy. African question, what was kind of the most. I think you said you've lived here nine, nine years. years, nine yeah. years. Um, how, you know, what was it like to kind of get into the discourse here? And did you mm-hmm. find yourself questioning some things or just being floored by some things, like not understanding it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, the first thing I think initially, like in 2014, when I started kind of doing my general ed classes and stuff, mm. uh, I was I would hear a lot of this, you know, some of like the the racial ideas that would creep into like the pedagogy of different classes, like symbolism. Symbolism was a very particular class because that's when I sort of gave in. I had a very like definite, vivid moment on Halloween, twenty fourteen, um, where my my instructor was talking about the hegemony hegemony. Hegemony? Mm-hmm. I'll never I, I, I say both. <laughs> <Change Okay. of laughs> um, but he was teaching about it and teaching about uh, Antonio Gramsci, Gramsci, another weird name I can't pronounce. And I remember thinking in that moment, just kind of surrendering and being like, like, fine, I guess this stuff is all true. Um, and I think even from that moment, like that moment, I viscerally like felt like, like a darkness kind of coming over me. Not to over like make it dramatic, but like 
that was genuinely my my moment of accepting it what i what i felt was like that's not really my experience but then i you know what i'm just gonna surrender because i'm new to america i'm tired of having to learn a culture and you know learn a language and learn how to get along with people i was just like i was 19 and i had already moved this was my fourth big move to a different country Mm -hmm. and so i was just like yeah just tell me how life works and i will listen to you and i will ingest it and you know live the life um but then eventually i you know i i embraced that whole like as a black woman you are sort of you know this this avatar of like everyone's disgust and um it wasn't too long where i just felt like if this was supposed to be empowering it seems like if every black person in this country is supposed to take on this this outlook we're we're loading ourselves with more anxiety and negativism like than than other people so technically this is working against us to live our lives lives with happiness and like gratitude yeah um and that's when i was just like you know what i'm not gonna force it anymore because i did live without this lens for my like high school years and even before that and i was just fine i was peaceful like i was just focused on like going to college and learning a skill like i wasn't really thinking about race that much i was like maybe let me try going back to that way of life um and that's sort of when i started peeling back so many like ideologies or or thoughts and ideas that weren't like i wasn't going to lose anything if i chucked them in the bin and that was through my process of just kind of forgiving people that i knew who had done things that i interpreted as racist were they racist i'll never know um i sort of just gave it grace and said you know what there could be a bigger reason behind the way people act the way they do it might just not be it might not just be like microaggressions in the moment like it might be a complex of you know mannerisms um that they that they adopted growing up like it's so complicated i'm just going to forgive you and i'm going to have more grace for anyone else i meet and i just want to focus on productivity and being an artist and like making my stuff um because this is not working uh for my benefit right right when you i'm just curious when you moved to the states did you did you move to california or did you live anywhere else yes i went okay. straight Church. to california Church. i did visit maryland yeah. for like a day or two <laughs> and then i was like okay i'm gonna live in la but yeah 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 okay um one thing i wanted to ask you about um is your painting because you're you're very talented on it. I know this is kind of like like a like a, like a shift, but don't worry. Well, I'm I'm sure I'm sure race and 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 all this sort of woke stuff will will, will pop it, back in the final. It always does. I know, but <laughs> um, but one thing I, I was looking through your painting, and I was I was really because w- w- when I hear that that uh, you know someone dabbles in painting in addition mm. to something else that they do, I'm just like, oh, okay, yeah. I look at their stuff. Yeah, okay, they're a pretty decent pa- uh, painter, but they yeah they should stick to singing. But when I look at your stuff, I was like, wow, <laughs> you're actually really talented. And I, I was like, well, I, I was actually really, really impressed with your style. Um, Thank you. And, and and there was one painting I'm, I'm uh, I was particularly impressed with, and the reason because I was wearing the, like the same shoe. That, hey. That you did, so, yeah. Um, but uh, um, yeah. So so how long have you been painting? I have been like painting and drawing, drawing mostly mm-hmm. since like before I could remember. To be honest, like yeah. so if I can think back to my childhood it had to have been before i was six years old so maybe like five yeah Uh, my siblings i had i have three older siblings i have one younger sibling but i would always follow what my older siblings were doing and a lot of them were drawing and we had like in uganda there were some art classes and it was very like technically focused Mm. so being that i had a huge age gap uh, and they were already in those art classes uh, when i was young i would just emulate whatever they were doing so i started really young and it just never stopped. I was kind of a daydreamer throughout my earlier grades. And so I was always doodling in the pages. And when I was tw- about 12 years old, uh, almost 13, I was like really like drawn to hyperrealism. Mm. Um, and so I would be on this art page called, I don't know if you know about it, Deviant Art, yeah, where yeah. people would like upload their artwork. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was so inspired by the pencil, like realism work. So I would always like practice that and, would do commissions for friends and would do like whatever, you know, whatever came next. So I had a lot of like experience with like the technical side of drawing. 
and uh, then painting came like later like 2018 is where I really got into painting I'd done like maybe a, a few paintings prior to that in high school yeah. but yeah and so that's how we got to painting in, in 2018. Wow that's amazing and and looking at your painting uh you have like this unique ability to kind of blend like hyper details but also sort of like impressionistic it's interesting. Like, like there, 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 hey. there, there's an aspect of it where it's kind of like, it, it, it's a little, it's a little blurry, but there's also some, some very hyper specific details that I love. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, you've got a very, you've got a very cool style. Um, Thank you so have, much. You, have you shown your work anywhere? Have you done like any art shows at all or, or any, you know? Yeah, I, I've done just like vending my art um, in North Hollywood. Cool. Uh, so I create prints of, of nice. those works and um, I had a display in a tea shop, tea pop in North Hollywood, mm. uh, but I haven't done any like bit major exhibitions or anything like that just yet. Mm. Hoping to do that in the future, hoping to sort of create bigger works. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of as much as I've done in terms of like, you know, physically putting it out there. Right, right. Yeah. And then you're a skater. Uh, you're a skater as well, which is cool because like there, there was there, which tended to to bleed into your your uh, painting as well. Yeah. Um. So so ha has has like you know uh, the, the different elements of like um your your, your interest have they you know are, are there other instances of, of how they kind of like meld or influence each other in any way at all? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like oh man, it's so crazy. Um, life is just really weird. Um like even this hat that I'm wearing, mm -hmm. it came out of like acquiring this hat came out of one of the craziest cancellations I have ever witnessed like here in, in LA. But that's a, it's a very long story. It's maybe not a story for this, this podcast, <laughs> but you know, like, like that moment influences like the skateboarding influences kind of my opinions on like the ultra woke side of things. Cause right. you know, when you're dealing with, a marginalized like trying to create a, mar a a niche for marginalized like women of color to skate in you're gonna get a lot of that critical social justice active in that space right, so that's right. where i get a lot of like my um kind of critiques for the movement and how mm. to better approach that and yeah. then that goes into like my artwork um which you'll see like a lot of skaters of people that i skate with and spend time in community with um and then you know the art somehow like some of my life experiences with all these people will, like lead back into the songwriting mm. um and so yeah that's kind of how those things like all feed each other and uh try i'm still try learning trying to figure yeah. out how to like better integrate stuff but yeah so um when you had just said trying to make a space for like women of color uh yeah. for skating and then the ideology just kind of like bleeds in mm -hmm. and i and i asked joe this too um you know being an la artist mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like it's authentic or do you feel like maybe it's one or two loud voices and no one else is really comfortable um you know uh debating it or, or maybe it works too strong or just having a different opinion so everyone just kind of nods their head and agrees and then give and does their yes and and this and um, or do you think that actually everyone does actually believe uh, what they're saying and yeah. this is more of a space for them to convene and, and discuss those topics? Um, that is a really good question. I've never, I don't think I've ever had to like really verbalize my opinions on that. Um, but I think a lot of people just kind of nod and go along with it because mm -hmm. it sounds good in the moment. I think a lot of younger people, maybe a teenage and maybe just kind of hitting 20s right now, Gen Z, they do kind of believe it. They really believe it. Mm. But I think there is an older generation, maybe like approaching 30, over 30. One side actually genuinely cares about getting like girls into skateboarding or getting like whatever mm. marginalized identity you might be, getting them into skateboarding. Um, and then there's a side that is actually more concerned about radicalizing young people and if this if skateboarding is the vehicle then they're gonna do it um and mm. i'm not just saying that just to just say it like there is really like anti-racist initiatives for skateboarding you can look it up in your own time um there's 
I mean, like, we believe you. We believe you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it will. I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, no, like, there are people who really care and they're like, let's do the thing that works the best. Um, yeah. And it's not always going to come from critical social justice, although there's, yeah. there's like blurred lines there. But sure. then there are yeah. other people who are just like, who are more concerned with um, political activism. Yeah. And then they're like, let me just put myself in this space because, you know, people are looking, you know, like they're, they're, uh, they're weird. Like they're weird people who are, who are in this space and maybe they'll find some sense of identity in this activism. And so yeah. let me kind of latch myself onto that. If that makes any sense, that's kind no, of what I've been seeing. It, yeah, it yeah. does. And and for me, uh, maybe authentic wasn't the right word, but I tend, tend to be that voice where I'll be like a group of people, usually, you know, uh, urban white collar workers. Right. Um, and everyone will be agreeing, nodding head. And, and I'll be the one who says, well, you know, have you thought about it this way? Or have you said this? And it makes people very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And politically, I'm all over the map. I mean, when you said earlier, there are left, like leftists who are just left wing, but against a lot of identitarian politics. That mm -hmm. I'm not a leftist by any means. I have some very left wing views, and I'm definitely like th those are the left wing podcasts and magazines and writers that I, I follow. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like a conservative or liberal thing, mm -hmm. uh, but just in terms of, I say maybe more mainstream or or yeah whatever the, yeah. the current thing, the current thing is, yeah. mm -hmm. I'll push back on it. And I, not to be a devil, I don't like the devil's advocate thing. I don't do that. But where there is actually substance to an argument or to a different side that I believe in or, or there's merit to, I will bring it up. And yeah. so many people are so unchallenged because usually their thinking has been uh, the fostered thinking in school and in college and yeah. in their corporate workspace and in their DEI pro and all of that. And then when you give like the slightest, tiniest bit of pushback, it's just, no, they, people can't handle it. Yeah. Um, and so, so that, that's what more of, I noticed it. So, and then there's a couple loud voices who actually really believe in the cause. And yeah. then it's just usually, well, I want to be a quote unquote ally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird when you meet people and they just kind of you know, you're, you're, you're talking about something that, that is completely unrelated to race or politics. And then, but they, yeah. they just casually throw around a lot of these book buzzwords. Mm -hmm. um, like it's, it, it, it's, it's bizarre. I, I remember, um, yeah. and, and, and they don't even realize kind of like how in many ways bigoted, they kind of come off by throwing around these terms in, mm -hmm. in, in, in certain uh, ways. For example, a few years back when I, when I was working at a Silicon Valley startup, um, uh, the team went out for lunch and, and one of, one of my coworkers had just gotten back from Denver. She was, she was meeting with another coworker who was reading, who's, uh, who worked remotely. And when she got back, I was like, Oh, Hey, so, so how's Denver? And she goes, yeah, it's really cool. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff to see, but you know, there's just not enough diversity there. And like, I didn't want to say anything because we're at lunch, but it's just sort of like, what do you mean? Di there's not enough di like, diversity of what? Like just, mm. there wasn't, there weren't enough skin colors or, there. Or, or, like, or what mm. neighborhoods did you go to? Right. Like, like right. there is yeah. not the neighborhoods you frequented. Like, right. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about yeah. uh, you. Uh, so language is very important mm. to us on this show. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one of the things that drove me the absolute most crazy during the, you know, pinnacle of the great awakening and still going on to this day is how words change, how quickly they change. And mm -hmm. how if you don't utilize that change, you are against us. You are the bigot, mm -hmm. you're the rate, whatever it is. Some of these words uh, as you probably know are things like racism. Thought we mm -hmm. had that one down. Apparently not. Uh, white white supremacy, uh, privilege, kind of um, that one. Uh, I I didn't know if Joe. I so I'm a, a legal services attorney, so I deal. All of my clients are either below the poverty level, at the poverty level, or a certain percentage within the poverty level. So, and mm -hmm. the vast majority of my clients are white. It's just the county I work in. So I mm -hmm. see this kind of like people are talking about white privilege, and I see people living in shitty trailers. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 I, anyway. Um, yeah. So just the term, just the, the blanket term of it mm -hmm. uh, is is uh, confusing to me. And then, of course, oppressed, victimization, all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. What's your definition of racism? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually really going through a, a lot of like uh, overhaul of like this definition and <laughs> specifically like even just race ism like genuine yeah. genuinely and generally mm -hmm. um 
I, I mean, it's just kind of like racism is like, you you know, you see someone of a different skin color and like you hate them for it or you treat them differently because of it. Um, That's my yeah. definition, treating someone differently based on the color of their skin, yeah. right? Like, and I thought we had that down. Yeah. Yeah, Systematic yeah. racism is some, like the same thing, but put in a system and yeah. someone like you who's lived in South Africa, which probably yeah. has the best example of systematic racism in the past 40 years, 30, 40 years. Apartheid, mm-hmm. like, I, I mean, that that's systematic racism. doesn't yep. mean there's more subversive systematic racism even today in the U.S. I'm not denying yeah. that in, in, in certain ways. Um, I think there are different ways to fix it, but mm-hmm. uh, like, th- like that's different than I think how the, uh, I call them, by the way, uh, I call them the crits. Uh, that's, a, yeah. that's a term that, I, that that's for for woke. I call I call them the crits. I call crit. I call the, I call wokeness crit logic. But uh, interesting. Um, Crit yeah, feel free, feel free to use crit it. Turn around. So, yeah, crit, crit you, have a, you have a big following, so feel free to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Spread it around. Shameless gotcha. plug. Um, oh, man. Uh, but anyway, and same with like white supremacy. Just like yeah. when I started seeing non-white people being called white supremacists, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't really get it. And yeah. I'll, I'm going to use the term uh, the Orwellian. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, that. it's very yep. Orwellian. Yep. Uh, just changing a word to fit your ideology, your worldview, your, you know, your narrative, I think is actually the more appropriate term. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. Do you have any insight on, on your yeah. definitions of white supremacy and privilege or? or... Right. Um, I do. I mean, like coming, like you said, South Africa was the, I feel like it is, should be, it should be the model for mm. discussions on race because literally you have, you have so much that happened there that was nationwide, first of all. It was very dramatic in the displacement of like black people. Like they lived in Bantu stands, which was like you had to move and then you had to like travel to the white areas. You had huh. to have a pass. Um, to get into the white areas, there were curfews, like you couldn't be there for too long. Like it's literally the most fascinating exercise in wow, like wow, this is really racism proper, you know. And this is the nineties, right? Like this is I mean, uh, this it ended in the nineties. So right. we could say like in nineteen ninety, this was still happening, you know? Right. Crazy. Um, Absolutely insane. crazy. Right. Yeah. And very fully alive in like the eighties and the seventies. So yeah. Uh, which, by the way, it was officially like established in 1948. So you're, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, early 90s. Um, It's not like it was much better before that. Exactly. There was so much more chaos happening. Yeah, it's not as good. (laughs) That was really a system of race, like a real system of racism. Yeah. yeah. And you had the people, and you know, we'll get back to the language bit in a second, but you had you know, people figuring out, like, once apartheid has ended, what do we do with the Black people who live in the Bantustans, who who live in the areas that are affected by apartheid? So you sort of have this, like, pseudo, I don't want to say pseudo, because I feel like it's more of the official version, but you had what critical race theory in America w- was trying to do. You had that in South Africa where people were like, how do we get everyone balanced out again and living in a nation of equality. And so they went through all those processes of like reparations and Mm -hmm. they did a lot of those things, but there was a goal for healing and unity and equality and becoming the rainbow nation, which is what they pride themselves in being the flag change to represent every person. There was a very uh, intentional effort not to victimize or make evil and antagonize white folks. It was like, sure. you guys have like, did a lot of bad stuff and you just like sat by and let apartheid happen, but we're really gonna work to like, get us all, you know, like getting, get along. Like we all need to get along. Right. Yeah. Um. So th- that language still, even though there was a lot of obvious privilege, a lot of obvious disparity, um, you don't, you still don't really, you didn't find in the early 2000s and 90s the type of language we use today in the American climate where, you know, even though two thirds of the, the uh, 20th century was Jim Crow, in, Jim Crow laws, um, it's just different given the time frame. And now we're in 2022 
There's so much more racial progress that has happened, yeah. but so many new words that don't apply to our current climate. Um, for example, when people say like systemic racism, like for me, I, I still, maybe I'm stupid, but I still don't get it. I'm like, right, right, right. I haven't gone to a place like in South Africa, you know, when we're applying for uh, an apartment or a house, you know, there's some areas where you have to like, you can't say your last name because they're going to be racist people who are like, oh, that's an African name. And you have to kind of disguise really? your voice because, you know, they don't want to, you don't want to let your African accent be pronounced. Like, though, that's like, you can say like, that's systemic racism. And I get right, that that right. might happen yeah. to some extent in America. But it's a little more my, aggressive than a, than a microaggression. <laughs> right, exactly. But yeah. when it comes to the American context, it's hard for me having lived there to really use that word systemic racism with my whole chest. Because right. I'm like, yeah, it just well, isn't. <sighs> anyway. So, so, so when, why I always push back against systemic racism is because for instance, I, I remember when, and, and I should start a New Orleans jar Joe for every time I bring up New Orleans. Cause yeah. I, I was sorry. I went to law school there. I was probably at my, like most, I, I don't, I don't want to say I was ever like woke or cause I was always for free speech and I was against a lot of this kind of craziness, but I was very, very progressive. Like that, that was at my most, I went to a very social justice oriented school, which I think did some great things. I learned some amazing things there. But um, there, so in New Orleans, like a lot of cities in the South are still fairly segregated, not by any system, not by mm -hmm. any um, laws, right? Like, like apartheid would be, or like the U.S. used to be, but mm -hmm. there are issues of like, for instance, white landlords renting to non-white yeah. or, or, or black, uh, black tenants. So there is a group that like would literally, you could be like a black student and sign up for this and you could go try and get an apartment. And then a white person would go and try and get an apartment. And if they told the black person that it wasn't available, then rented the white person it would be illegal, right? But that's the thing. Mm -hmm. It would be illegal. It's against yeah. the FHA. Like yeah. that shows that it's not the system. The system is actually trying to protect the, exactly. the minority group. It's still racism. Like there is mm -hmm. racism, but it's not systematic racism. The system yeah. is actually trying to prevent the race system. Maybe yeah. it's not doing enough. That's a different argument. But this, but um, it, it's not what I think people, I think people just say widespread racism is systematic racism. And I mm -hmm. will push back against that. I mm -hmm. also want to bring up, and I, this kind of segued into, I have a whole category here about forgiveness. Forgiveness yeah. seems to be one of your big themes. Yeah. And um, Nelson Mandela, after apartheid and after he was, uh, after he left Robben Island, I guess you would say. Yes. Um, and he came back and made a point to one called the Rainbow Nation. And, and I don't mm -hmm. know if a lot of people realize South Africa actually has lots of other populations. There's a huge Indian exactly. and Pakistani popula population, Asian. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's the rainbow nation. I think most people just think yeah. black and white. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also even within South Africa, I know that one of the biggest issues, correct me if I'm wrong, is mm -hmm. South Africa, like black South Africans and Mozambicans, like black mm -hmm. Mozambicans. I, I don't know too much about that, but right. I know because the Mozambicans are looked at as coming in to be like more cheap labor. I don't right. know enough about that, but yeah. anyway, so Nelson Mandela made a point to reconcile. Yeah. Um, and unlike the U S where the oppressive group during our, let's just call it apartheid, whatever you want to call it was the vast majority, right? Was the majority in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It was the total opposite. Exactly. Like the, the non-white populations could have really punished the white populations for Listen, yes. what they did. Yeah. And we saw a little of that that did happen to an extent in Zimbabwe, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But in South Africa, and you tell me, that didn't happen because yeah. it wouldn't have, I think, the, and I'm sure there were calls for it. Mm -hmm. But people like Nelson Mandela, who's, you know, obviously a, a hero for yeah. many people made a point to say no we're not going to punish we're not going to yeah. get retribution we're going to reconcile yeah totally actually funny enough that you say that um this book does have like like desmond tutu this is called I'm, the rainbow people of god if anyone's interested in getting it um, I'm, it has, I'm one of those people I actually have a note here to say oh, can nice. you recommend me a book about desmond tutu because i know you bring yes. up two books a lot yes. a very long reading list so pit so tell me which are the better ones yeah um, <laughs> but, but i will add it Yes, this one's really cool because it's just a collection of his speeches and letters throughout his okay. um, time fighting apartheid. And one of them is literally the exact speech he gave to say, like, don't become like your oppressors yeah. by fighting back and trying to, like, he went to quench 
um, certain like violent uprisings that were like, okay, finally now we have power as the majority yeah. quote race. Um, so we're gonna fight back. And he's like actively saying we can't become like them. Like don't do yeah. this and don't. So it's very like what you said. It's a very real thing, a very real issue that was successfully like squashed. And sure, like you have skirmishes that happen. But this could have played out way worse than it actually played it out. It could have been a genocide. It basically it could, have could have been, been a genocide, a genocide of, of an entire population, which was, yeah. at the time, I don't, what was the white population of South Africa then? 20%? 15? Something like that. I'm not sure on yeah. the statistic, but it, it could have been easy, small. basically. Yeah, yeah, it could have been easy. And there, like you said, there were other groups like the Indians, colored is another category in South yeah, Africa. Yeah, these colored. Um, Asians. So it was a lot of. There was a lot of potential for pushback. Right. Um, but the fascinating... Wait, what was your question? I might I might answer this a little um, bit wrong. Um, or were I you just know. like bringing up the... the I was just... Just, chat, just about... Yeah, about like we're past apartheid, yeah. which... And you said it would be a model. And yeah. so maybe oh, yes. expand on that. How how the Nelson Mandela Desmond Tutus uh, of the world could yeah. be more of a model for reconciliation. Absolutely. Um so one of the, the crazy and amazing things of what happened following apartheid was this thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mm. um, which was headed by Desmond Tutu. And he talks about this entire thing in a book, another recommendation called No Future Without Forgiveness. Um, so that's like, you know, Tutu just speaking about how he established this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, how he, you know, modeled it kind of... Um, and how, how it panned out, what happened. So basically, the gist of it was if someone knew that they would be granted amnesty for admitting to their wrongs and being accountable for what they did under apartheid, they're more likely to actually say that they did what they did. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, if the, you're going to say everyone who comes forth, like, you're all going to jail and you're, like, you're done for life, you know, um, there wasn't going to be truth coming to the surface, right? So you had apartheid policemen who did literally the crate, like just brutal, brutal murders for fun. Like they would like tie people to the back of their car, like black men and just drive them around till they're dead and then throw their bodies in the river and have a barbecue and burn the body. Like just brutal, gruesome Jesus. stuff that no one would have ever known this happened if they just like, you know, apartheid ended and we just moved on. So um, the families of like these people who were killed and like who suffered, they would be like, you know what? They they held the power to say like, okay, we want justice or we're going to like grant forgiveness. And a lot of them were like, you know, we want to forgive these people, but we want to know what happened to our missing son, missing daughter. Mm. And so a lot of this process was them, you know, the pe the victims saying like, you know, our son went missing and the police just said that he, you know, killed himself. And then the police would just be so burdened by the guilt, but also trying so hard to like, you know, find a way to live their lives after all of this chaos that they would just admit and confess to it. Mm. And they, they, they had the possibility of being granted amnesty and kind of being forgiven for that and integrated into society because a lot of them were operating under orders or because this was the norm. You know, it was sort of like just racism was the norm of the day. However, there are many ex examples of this. Like it was very complicated, but very intricate process that integrated mm -hmm. a lot of forgiveness. Um, and the way that I find it useful for the American context is when you take these diversity trainings that are happening, um, what you often have is is that assumption of like, okay, you're just racist, you're white, so naturally you've done A, B, C, D. Like, I don't even need to get you, to know you as a person or what you've done, but you're just guilty and you're terrible. So I need you to write this apology letter and you're going to spend the rest of your life doing the work to repair what we assume you did. Right, um, right. Whereas, and that's a generalization, there are different diversity, equity, inclusion practices. But what I think would be helpful, and Desmond Tutu talks about this in the Book of Forgiving, um, is, is just getting down to the specifics between the people who were hurt and the people who did the hurting. Hmm. And allowing people to kind of go through a mini Truth and Reconciliation Commission process where if I say, Ben, like, 
you know, say like we're in the room together as as colleagues at workplace at the workplace, and like mm -hmm. one day you were like, you said something, maybe you said a racial slur, and you're like, I'm not gonna give you know Kimmy this promotion or this work or this assignment because I don't really want you know black people representing the company, and that and I overhear that right, and so we have this like workplace tension. I would come to you in this you know diversity setting and be like mm. Ben there was a time where you said this and it really hurt me. Um, and, you know, you both confront like, yeah, you also kind of admit like, yeah, sure. I, I said this and maybe it was out of ignorance at the time. Mm -hmm. And I have the option to like grant you forgiveness and maybe like renew that relationship and be like, you know, that was wrong, but let's start over. And just being really specific, but also really intentional with the fact that I'm not going to cancel you. I'm not going to like ostracize you. Um, but let you know in advance that this is not going to be the end of the world if you do kind of have accountability for that issue. Um, yeah. Right. And and that's something that, that I want to talk more about with regards to to you know arts and pop culture. Like you, you know, like I, I know I know everyone's talked about this ad nauseum, but you know, like the whole Will Smith, you know, Chris Rock thing. Yeah. A after that, there were there were numerous people and even some celebrities who who went on social media and were talking like they were just talking about how they were so traumatized by that that incident, and it was like, oh, it was bizarre. It was weird. It was sort of like you know, I need to take some time away to to deal with this 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 violence. I was on live television and blah blah blah. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Meanwhile, they're just refreshing their feeds about like bombing in Ukraine, <laughs> right? right. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's weird. You know, getting back to, to to the theme of 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 healing and 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 forgiveness, it's this weird thing where it's like. And, and and I'm hoping that this is just a Twitter phenomenon. Like this does not seem to be something that, that happens, you know, in, in real life. But th there's this weird thing where it's like um, not letting things go is mm. seen as a virtue. Um, you know, constantly broadcasting yes. to the world how hurt you're feeling by something that didn't even actually directly impact you. Mm -hmm. um, that's celebrated in certain quarters, certain corners of, of, of you know, the, the entertainment industry and in pop culture and things. Yeah. Um, it's such a bizarre thing. And, and, and like, I'm, I'm sure like it just um, pales in contrast to like what happened in South Africa. I was like, no, these were yeah. real atrocities that were being, you know, like uh, addressed. And this is, yeah. you're, you're talking about some dumb, thing that happened on tv <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm curious about like your your, your thoughts on that if, if, yeah. you, if you notice anything like this i mean i feel like people just they and this kind of will bleed into a religion a little bit but mm -hmm. i feel like Good. people have like a certain like vacuum that they try to fill for feeling like they're doing the right thing and being a good person and if they can achieve that through you know um finding faults in other people and then making them pay forever it somehow makes them feel a little bit better like yeah i'm i'm a good person i'm holding people accountable yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think that's why it's hard to let go because it's like once you forgive people and you're you know it's like it's like what standard do i compare myself to now that like you know i realize that i'm just as bad as everyone else mm. um I do notice that a lot and I, I, I really don't know. And I guess maybe there is a lot of darkness in Hollywood and people people just be living their life doing whatever they want to do. And so it's like, ah, like, you know, how do I get rid of that sense of guilt? I have to just like make sure someone else gets like the crucifixion, like, yeah. ah, like you suck in order to make myself feel like I'm doing something amazing. Right. So um, that's just my opinion. So yeah, like the, the crit ideology has... I've, it's been compared to a religion r rightfully so yeah. for for a while um and i you know sidebar the the best uh visual of this to me was i, I can't believe i was seeing this was right you know in minneapolis where of course george floyd was murdered mm -hmm. um it was a bunch of main, main vast majority white like 20 year olds teens 20 year olds literally carrying on a podium or on mm -hmm. not a podium but on a, a slab or some sure. pedestal right a big mm. raised fist, like an icon, wow. through the streets of Minneapolis. And I was like, right. this is the most religious symbolism I've seen in this mm. movement so far. But mm -hmm. but anyway, um, uh, to me, it has the, sh the shittiest parts of religion. Like yeah. it has the, yeah. the tearing down, it has the um, 
the uh turning the turning on each other the mm -hmm. uh, the original like kind of the original sin is that you know yeah. america's racist and, and as a white person you have that original sin of being racist and you have to get the pastor uh who let's let's use kendi as the pastor and what mm -hmm. I, I i i call kendi and i i'm i know i've talked about this before joe like the great he's just next in line of kind of the great american swindler or fraudster because mm -hmm. what he does is he takes a term like we talked about racism mm -hmm. and we know racism is bad very very few people think racism is not bad yeah uh, and especially white people because we're drilled from the vast majority of us that you know this is our history there's some dark history there um it's bad and you have to not be racist right mm -hmm. everyone is on board with that yeah then he comes along and says actually white people you know racism is bad right and we're like yeah yeah totally well did you know that you're actually racist unless you're anti-racist and right. white people go whoa what what's that and he's like funny you should ask i wrote a book mm -hmm. about it right describing this term called basically here's my snake oil uh, I'm playing off of what your your affliction, and I have the remedy. It's like it, it's just what American fraudsters have been doing since the beginning of our country. Um, mm. So uh, unfortunately, the the um, the ideology doesn't have the forgiveness aspect to it, which is yeah. in a lot of religions. But let, let's use Christ Christianity, um, which is one of the most important parts of Christianity. I know this is a big. Yeah part of your life as, as, as I saw on your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think forgiveness should play? And I know we were just kind of talking about that with the Truth yeah. and Reconciliation Commission, but in an American way, like yeah. how, how do you think, um, I guess you kind of already said this with, with the uh, with the example of you and me in the corporate mm -hmm. office, but mm -hmm. maybe on a broader scale, like, yeah. well, what do you think forgiveness could play in the discourse and yeah. corporations and universities and basically mm -hmm. all, all these interactions that we have yeah great question i think first it's important to re realize like that the anti-racist discourse that we have right now that's super mainstream i i really feel like it's very policy driven it really has nothing to do with healing it has mm -hmm. nothing to do with like getting people together it's kind of how can we attach racial like binaries to you know like whiteness represents anything that you vote on that isn't liberal and progressive which is pro-black it's like you you try to attach those two together and you get people to think that way and see that way so they don't care if that raises tensions just as long as it gets people to act and be active in a particular direction we are successful so it's important to realize and really gauge in your heart, like, do you feel like this is doing a great job? Like, do you feel more peace and harmony like with your folks or with your friends, with this ideology being prevalent in your language? If you don't, and if you just are like, you audit that and you're like, you don't, then it's more likely that you need to reframe your understanding of race to be geared towards healing and not to be geared towards policy change. And I think that takes a lot of, peeling back of everything really so much so too i'm kind of at the place where i'm like even the idea of race is kind of it, everyone knows like race isn't you know there are categories that are just kind of vague and slapped sure. on sure. and they don't really mean a lot um we have to and this was desmond tutu's heart as well kind of become non-racial and see each other as humans mm -hmm. and be pro-human um rather than just be anti-racist like you have to be like look, I really want to get along with you. That's the whole point. That's why I think racism is bad, is I want all of us to get along together and celebrate our differences um, and celebrate our not only diversity and identity, but diversity of thought. And so when you adopt like a forgiveness lens, you're not so quick to say, that was racist. I know it because, you know, white cis men hold power in every interaction. So it was either racist or sexist. No, you're saying, I'm going to extend grace and in fact say i do not know if that was just racism i do not mm. know if that was sexism i'm just giving you the benefit of the doubt i'd like to think maybe it was an indigestion issue that caused people to act crazy um you know sometimes when you're holding in a fart you can act real crazy <laughs> so I, I know a lot of those have to do with farts more than anything <laughs> um, so yeah it's just walking with life with grace and understanding and kind of doing the opposite from critical theory, which is to say definitely racism was present here to kind of going to 
no, maybe something else happened and I'll never know all the answers, but should this affect me? I will not let it affect me. I will right. forgive you. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, being a, a, a black female uh, creator in LA, have you noticed much in, in you know, like the, the, the creative communities here in LA, um, like uh, any, you know, maybe not necessarily preferential treatment but have you mm. have you ever encountered anyone who was sort of like oh you know you should you should you know the, the, this thing is looking you know they're looking for diversity you you, you should yeah. you should go for that or or, or it, have you experienced much of that of, of people kind of pushing yeah. you towards these things you're sort of like look i just want to create i don't care who yeah. it's for it's just as long as i can get my word out as, as long as i can get my stuff out there have you experienced yeah. much of that push yeah kind of in like when i was more drawn into like the woke stuff there was like a lot of initiative and a lot of um you know if you sort of played into the whole like oh i'm a black woman therefore buy my art like people would give you money out of like kind of guilt-based buying mm. um but i just found it to be like eventually you realize that people aren't really buying things because they care about you or your art per se yeah. it's more like they're buying it for them to feel better about themselves so right 100 in my opinion Right. You end up thinking that like your art is, you know, it's good because people are buying, but it's like, no, like, I don't know how to put that into words. I, but... So I, 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 guarantee, I guarantee you in the situation where you're selling your art in North Hollywood, right? Uh, at a coffee shop or tea yep. shop. Um, can you give me, a, can you give me an example of a piece that you have? Like, like what is it? Um, the Adidas shoe. The Adidas one. shoe. Yeah. Is yeah. the Adidas shoe? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just an Adidas shoe. Just an Adidas shoe. Okay, yeah. guarantee you that yeah. if a like a, a white liberal progressive buys that put and puts in their home, they feel good about it. One hundred percent of the time, when anyone comes in, they're going to say, "I bought this from a black, black. female mm -hmm. artist." Right? It's not just because of the love of the, which I think sucks, and yeah. uh, it doesn't speak to your work. It's be, it, like you said, it's to make them feel good. Yeah, it's, it, it's to make them feel like they um, yeah. are, are an ally. And yeah. uh, and I'm curious uh to know have you ever been pressured to and i've heard this more um in the kind of writing community i, mm -hmm. I, I i'm a writer also and mm -hmm. for a lot of one of the critiques that a lot of um let's say non like non-white men mm -hmm. have of the industry is every story they just want me to write about my quote-unquote lived experience a term yeah. I, I think is redundant but yeah, yeah. just my experience um whether I'm a black woman or a gay man or, or whatever it is. And I, maybe I don't want to tell that story, but they're like, yeah. no, part of that's business. Well, that's what sells. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but that's what's being published. So you have to write this type of story. If you're an immigrant, you have to write the immigrant story. If you're, yeah. um, you know, Vietnamese American, you have to write that. If you're a black man, you have to write that. Instead of just like writing maybe whatever story you want. Yeah. Um, have you felt any of that pressure? Yes. Like mm -hmm. big yeah. time, actually. Like I, one of the reasons I've kind of paused, not it's, I, I don't think it's a long pause, but I've paused my YouTube videos a bit because I want to focus on art and speak to this exact issue, mm. which is a lot of like black art that you see. Um, I don't want to use the word fad because I think it is kind of here to stay and it's a good thing. I think people representing different like features and portraiture, like that's sure. a really good thing. But I feel yeah. like everyone just stops on the fact like the subject is black. And right. the painter is black. Right. Therefore, this is a good painting. And, you know, like, what if the painting was actually meant to be about, um, like, motherhood or food or some other abstract yeah. topic, but all you're fixed on is just a black artist did this and it is a black subject. Uh, the person is a black sub subject. So, you know, like, this is great art. Therefore, uh, you know, I'm doing diversity. I'm doing the work. I right. struggle with that a lot. And I... I really want to, it hinders me that I can't really get grants, you know, cause I'm not, you know, I'm not playing into the whole thing. So I, right, it's, right. it sucks for me, but it's like, I'd rather create out of a place of criticizing this new wave of performative buying than, mm. than fall into it. So yeah, it right. is actually a very um, huge concern of mine. Cause I want to speak to certain psychological things like, like narcissism and spiritual aspects, but I yeah. don't want everyone to get hung on the fact that it's a you know it's a black woman and uh, and then lose the actual meaning behind 
the heart of the work, but it's kind of like it is what it is. Like, yeah. Right. I mean, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about this last week and we're sort of like, you know, um, it's, 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 it's kind of a shame that so many um, talented artists choose to make a, a, a very strictly political statement with their work. And it's, and, and, and again, it's, it, it, it's, it's not simply that, that, that making that, that addressing politics through your work is bad. Like that's, that's mm -hmm. totally fine. But it's sort of like, you know, like there are other aspects to life than just simply voting one way or the other or, yeah. or celebrate, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, what about, you know, love and heartbreak and tragedy and drama and humor and what about yeah. and spirituality? What about all these other things that we can explore mm -hmm. through art? It's also yeah. not very, it's also like not, um, subversive anymore if every university and corporation and media outlet and every single and your boss and every single group supports the the message because that's mm -hmm. that's not really like pushing any boundaries pushing the envelope or anything like that which yeah used to be the case for for so much art and now it's just um you know the the agree applause or, or whatever it is yeah. it's, it's the same thing so you're just saying the thing we like you're mm -hmm. not doing the thing and and i saw this a lot with comedians like comedians used to oh, and, and yeah. some a lot still do but it, it used to be a big deal to like make someone kind of laugh uncomfortably yeah. like i said something that was like they're enjoying themselves and they're not sure if they should laugh and they do laugh and that was fun mm -hmm. and now you watch snl and it's just the the center left establishment talking point and everyone just mm -hmm. claps because you're saying the thing i agree i call it the seal clap it's just everyone mm. claps because you're doing yep. the thing it's a clapter I, I didn't think of that so, someone said that but that, that's mm -hmm. going it's clapter it's it's not yeah uh, a, a real response to something funny that might be subversive right. or yeah but, yeah yeah it's really the whole thing the whole you know ideological movement um it's watering down like deeper surface level things and, you know, I don't mean to say this in a kind of grievance-based way, but in a way it does sort of go back to this idea that, like, white is normal. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, there's a fetish fetishization of um, the other. And so, like, oh, man, sure. like you said, like, let's get this Pakistani writer because they're not normal. Like, they're not the norm. Um, mm -hmm. And so let's just fixate on their surface-level identity markers. And meanwhile, we get to, like, talk about all other aspects of life um which is i think yeah. what they're trying not to do but they end up doing it anyway uh there's this great video from abba and preach on youtube that they just put out that uh, the title is like both sides contribute to extremism and in it they talk about how like those well-meaning like you know allies like they end up still kind of bossing every other color around and being like no, yeah. you have to do it this <laughs> way and, and they take yeah. pride in that and it's like oh come on but yeah, there's um uh, uh Roger Ebert. Uh, there's a video of him at, at some film festival years ago. Yeah, and um he he he, he was in the audience. Um, so he, he was just there just to cover the festival. And there was a filmmaker there. I can't remember who it was, but but he was an Asian filmmaker, and he made a film, and, and he was doing a Q and A session. Mm -hmm. And somebody in the audience called out the Asian director mm -hmm. because his film did not have an Asian lead. Oh, and and he, and he was like, you know, you're 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 the director. Like, you you've got the final say in this. How come you didn't put more Asians in your film? Mm. Um, and then Roger Ebert, uh, he stood up and and then he basically kind of shut shut this guy down. He's like, look, he, he's the director. Yeah, you're right. But he can make the he make he can make uh, the lead character whatever race, whatever color, whatever gender he wants. Like that's mm -hmm. it's like it's just because he's Asian, right. like doesn't mean that he has to ca put Asians in his film. Like he can do whatever he right. wants. Like, he's sir, this movie takes place in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> exactly. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh but, nah, yeah. I'm, that, that, I'm, I'm glad because I thought you were going to say something. I was like, no, not Roger Ebert too. No, no, he was, he was uh, on the good side here. He was like, I mean, was, he, he, was, he passed away a yeah. while, like a decade ago, 2013, I think. Yeah, yeah almost about a decade, decade ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's so, also so like you know, I, I've always been a big big fan of his writing. So 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 me yeah, kind of looked great. up to him a little more. He just oh, that's cool. Like he was actually. He was, yeah. he was calling this stuff out even before things really And I'm assuming well. that the the critic, not Roger Ebert, the other yeah. critic yeah. was white. I believe so. This is this yeah. is a video from a while. And it was with someone's cell phone, like old tiny right. cell phone. So yeah. I, 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 that's basically the Stone Age. I know, yeah. yeah. Right. So I, I'd have to re revisit it. But it was it, but yeah, I, I was really glad that, that he was sticking up. Yeah. Like, yeah, let, let the artists create whatever they want. 
I mean, right. that's, I think that's the bit. And I, and I love these. This is one of our terms. Uh, another, you're, you're free to use it. Is it called an intersectional pretzel? It's where oh. like two of these groups that are supposed to be, according to the crit, like downline, if you are this or you believe, yeah. like if you are this, if you identify this way, you have to believe this. Then sometimes those things clash, right? Yeah. Uh, an example I use a lot in London, there will be like a gay pride parade and Muslim men protesting it right and it's like mm -hmm. oh what do we do they're both like protected groups well, yeah. Like, okay. yeah but I, I think a more recent one in the u.s was for for a year and a half or so it was like right wing did anti-mandates and left wing was pro-mandates right and left wing mm -hmm. was pro-blm and right side was anti-blm whatever mm -hmm. um in new york city uh the vast and and also the narrative was well all the people who aren't getting the vaccine are like redneck trump supporters right mm -hmm. well actually new york city only about i think two like two-thirds of black people at one point black new yorkers mm -hmm. were not vaccinated yeah and then these mandates come down that say oh you can't go to the restaurant you've been going mm -hmm. to for two generations you can't go to the grocery store to feed your family and there were blm protests against the mandate and yeah. you didn't hear shit about it except for like a couple of like the right wing or alternate outlets but like yeah. there were legit protests against the mandates um yeah. which the establishment media couldn't handle they didn't know how to cover it because are we going to start with the mandates or with blm intersectional pretzel eat it up yeah <laughs> man that's a good one i don't feel that <laughs> to, to, uh, yep. you have my permission take it <laughs> <laughs> um also yeah. you mentioned earlier i, I do want to touch on a couple more things about the forgiveness uh, yes. uh aspect of all this whatever uh one are you because you said there are some different uh dei i call it die because mm -hmm. i wish it would but like di <laughs> views um mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with chloe valdery yes okay yeah. i think yes, she I has although she uses terms like anti-racism and stuff i don't really like but mm -hmm. i think her approach is like yeah. what needs to be adopted if anything's going to be Absolutely. adopted i think like i, I think it's called yeah. theory of enchantment Yes. Yeah, um, that's right. And I don't know the specifics. I have looked into it before. I uh, and maybe you know more. And, and please uh, uh, give insight on it. But it's much more to me. Feels much more like a Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu Absolutely. style. Yeah. Of yeah. you don't. I, I'm not going to go through the tenets because I don't know them off the time. But it's like you don't criticize unless you're going to build up. Like it's not yes. just a, it's not just a pull down. That's one of them. Uh, do mm. you have any any um, thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm also very not very familiar with the detail of it, but I have heard mm. her on like Jordan Peterson's podcast, which was okay. really amazing. And oh, I was like, oh that. yeah, yeah, listen to it because I was like, oh yeah, I absolutely agree with this. It yeah. does seem very much in alignment with like the Nelson Mandela Desmond Tutu approach, um, and I, mean, I think that humanism. is actually like, like humanism mm. indeed. Like the mm -hmm. focus is restoring people and restoring them to come together in unity. Yeah. Um, whereas like you contrast that with a lot of this other stuff, it just doesn't seem like that's the aim. Like there's no, actually, there's no, um, you know, when you gauge something for feedback, like you have a feedback loop and you're like, is this working? And okay, we need yeah. to change this. That doesn't exist for that other constructive DEI criticism, stuff. constructive yeah. criticism. It's like, yeah. Oh, you don't like it. You're it's racist. A, Let's a keep going. It's a struggle session. It's cultural Marxism versus yep. like a, a Christian forgiveness. And they're, exactly. they're at odds, which is ironic because yeah. Mandela was a communist, but he maybe was. when he came out, he yeah. wasn't. I mean, I'm not sure was, about that. He was a communist when he went into prison and right. he was involved with the South African Communist Party. But the South African Communist Party still helped all the way through, even with the forgiveness thing. Um, Ah, Hani, I forget his name. I think it was Chris Hani or one of the leaders of it. I might be confusing names. Was still very much a part of like mm. the liberation and unity struggle. But I think they all kind of came to a point where it was like, there's this quote that says like, anger is too great a burden to bear. I think mm. that was like MLK. I might be wrong. Um, but yeah, the Communist Party was still very much involved and wasn't opposed to the whole like forgiveness thing. Mm. Um, okay. Even though they didn't get power at all, it was the ANC. But, right. you know, I feel like people came to a point where it's like, we want to heal. Like, no, we want to heal. We don't want to just use this for power all the time. Um, so even to like leftists who think that uh, we have to be, we always have to have this tension all the time. Um, you know, it's just to say, you know, if you look at Mandela, he still sort of had his ideologies, although he kind of gave way to a de democracy. But mm. um, 
you don't have to let people live in hate and animosity to just have like this utopia that you're pining for. Um, we can be healed and then learn about politics after the healing or, you know, better practices or policies or that sort of thing. Yeah. And then, um, uh, agreed. And then the last example I, I like to bring up is, are you familiar with Daryl Davis? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, think I just he's... met him like a, like, oh, a you, you met ago, him like a month ago. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, then please. Yeah. He's Tell us about amazing. Him. Yeah. 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 Can you, can you tell, tell listeners oh, what he does? Yeah. I mean, Daryl Davis has for, um, I think since the eighties or nineties. Yeah. I think it was early eighties. Eighties. Yeah. Yeah. He's been like deprogramming KKK members, uh, and has since had over 200 KKK members leave the KKK through his, his process. That's again, not very different from like Chloe Valdery's approach. I believe he has five um principles in which to have conversations with people of the opposite aisle who don't believe what you believe in fact are very extreme um i don't want to get them wrong so i'm not going to try and repeat them because I, I don't know them by memory sure. but he has used those five principles to hold conversations with even like the grandmasters in the kkk like real big leaders all the way up to like charlottesville kkk folks mm. he's had some of them like deprogrammed so radically so much so that he was um, a part, a huge part of one of their weddings. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, he's wow. amazing. He's got people to give their KKK hoods yeah. to him as like, look, I'm I'm out of this for for good, and you can like have my robes as evidence. And he, I got to see one of them in like real life. Like he gave a presentation, wow. and I wasn't prepared for how emotionally like impactful that is when you see it in real life. Wow. Um, but yeah, that's what he's he's done. It's what he's still doing, and, and and he's not doing it by getting a bunch of KKK members in a room and yelling at them and saying you're a backwoods moron, yes. which they I mean they are. But he's not right. doing that. He's not uh, belittling them. He I, I think I, I think the first one that he still is friends with, who's not the KKK member anymore, like yeah. they just start talking in a bar. Yeah, because the guy liked how he played guitar. Exactly, and, and, yeah. and like that's all. So yeah. uh, I know. Yeah, yeah. It's just um, you know more speech. Yeah, good speech. It doesn't mean you're always gonna convert someone. I mean, to be honest, it takes courage to do what he does, and I think yeah. that would be like. I, I think that's an extreme example that mm -hmm. not everyone can reach. Like, I wouldn't blame. Yeah, vast majority of black people to. Talk, even want to talk to a KKK member. Right, right. I, like, Absolutely. Course, I, yeah. Of course not. They wouldn't yeah. want they wouldn't like my southern Italian Catholic ass either. But like <laughs> let's do, like I, I don't wear that on my sleeve. But um but that that should be kind of the model in a mm -hmm. way of yeah. uh, of really addressing people who not just like disagree with you but like think less of you for the color yeah. of your skin or, or for your identity yeah. who think you're like subhuman or um uh like just less than yeah. and uh and worse than that i mean i'm being way too light on them that i just can't think of the right word but that should be kind of the model doesn't mean exactly. everyone can attain that but it should not be like the starting point that's mm. like the starting point should not be the robin d'angelo style just uh, any yeah. uh, the catch-22 if you don't, if you don't argue with us, um, or if you argue with us, then you're just fragile. And yeah. That, so that's just you have to agree with us, or else right. it's, it's a captive audience. So. Yeah. Um, I, I. It's amazing think, you like, met him. That's I so mean, cool. it was all thanks to this organization, Fair, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I know Fair. Yeah, um, they're awesome and. It was through a, a certain like trip in where we all kind of converged in Miami. That's where I got to meet them in here. Is, Mil is Melissa Chen involved in Fair? Yes, Melissa Chen. And is. She's got that yeah, podcast she... with Angel Eduardo, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She, I actually emailed with her about because they were looking for attorneys. And, oh, <laughs> oh. But I, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not dating. That, that was a couple of years ago, but oh, um, oh. Like Fair a lot and and yeah. Fire a lot too. Oh uh, man, yeah. yeah. Feel free to. You know, we can talk after this if you're still interested. Um, I'd love to connect you to them. We. I speak, you know, we, as I'm actually an action fellow for FAIR now. Um, oh, cool. So I'm happy to continue to spread the word of what they're doing. But yeah. Great. Yeah. I mean, they're doing what the ACLU used to do. 
which, yes. which used to be used to be my dream job. I, I still actually have a CLU sticker on my laptop. I can't get it off. <laughs> but, <laughs> they got but, acids that but, can burn that off, man. Oh, yeah, man. I, I swear I have it. I have it right right on the other side of here. That, that used to be my dream job. Was to work yeah. at CLU, not not anymore. Uh, oh. But is there anything yeah. else you want to you want to touch on, Kimmy? Before I mean, we're about, we're at like an hour and a half. Or Joe? Yeah. Yeah, Kimmy. Um, I, I just want to ask if if um, what's going on culturally is is impacting your creative work at all. We we, we, we yeah. haven't talked much about your your your, your rap career. Mm. Um, so 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 I was curious if if um, you know yeah any of the stuff yeah. has impacted your creative process at all. Yeah, there's a. I definitely feel like I. I I don't know if I want to talk because I know Joe. We talked about a song that I'm working on. Oh, okay. Um, but that's I'll keep that you know. Um, low key for the time being because i'm sure. still kind of debating when i when i want to put it out but yes if sure, sure. for a broader answer yes uh, a lot of this like social justice and the way people are talking about social justice is kind of impacting the visual art and also like the the so songwriting that i'm about to put out as well and work on uh but that's still under like construction i'm still working on it still producing it trying to figure it out um and then yeah hopefully by the summer we'll have some things happening cool well, we'll uh, that's happen. confirmed then so we got a we got a confirmed yeah. date and, and, yeah and we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. If, if you want it we'll definitely have you back on yeah this was, a, totally. this, was a fast, this was a quick hour and a half yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i it was great talking to you all and joe i'm jealous you get to hang out with everyone in person like, even, <laughs> even my friends even, even my friends who i i grew up with who now live in la oh wow yeah oh man and it was funny is that they all live in the same area like alma yeah, yeah. Kimmy, yeah. Oh, Kimmy does too. You did too. Yeah, like they, they yeah. all kind of live centuries, uh, mm. like, like North Hollywood, uh, Studio yeah. City area. That's mm -hmm. I know. Um, I, I'm East Coast through and through, so. Gotcha. But, but I, I, I visited in November, and I'll yeah. be I'll be back there again. Amazing. At some point. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We should all hang out. Come through. Absolutely. Do a conference. We'll, we'll do a live show. Conference. We did we, we yeah. did live shows in, in yeah. Joe's backyard, which were very yeah. fun. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm but, there. Um, uh, Kimmy, do you have any other projects coming up at all that you want to talk a little about? Anything? Yes. Yeah. And, and where and where everyone can find you. Yes. Totally. Um, so I have, I'm going to be teaching three webinars. Um, if anyone of your audience is interested in race no. and Christianity, um, those two topics specifically and how they kind of converge, I will be teaching that with this organization, Northern Seminary, uh, May, uh, June, July. Uh, three dates there so stay tuned to my website kimikatiti.com if you're interested um yeah that's kind of all that i'm i'm kind of gearing up for right now awesome cool yeah well kimmy thank you so much for coming on the show um we'll we'd love to have you back on um and feel free to invite okay. yourself on the show and it, yeah, dead serious <laughs> dead serious i i, I we've told all of this like anytime that you have like any project coming out or a single yeah. coming out just like hey uh, i got a thing coming out next month can i come on your show like we'd love to have you on so most def i will i will be like yeah joe like come <laughs> <on."> <laughs> yeah for sure Thank all you right so much everyone stay all reckless right. everyone stay reckless joe and kimmy <laughs>